When the Ronin 4D first came out, for a very good reason, everyone was so focused on the revolutionary gimbal camera combo DJI introduced for the first time. But there was barely any useful information about the most important part of the camera, the sensor. So I thought maybe there's not much to say about it. Fast forward one year, DJI asked me if I would test out its sensor, and as I compared it against the FX3 and the Red V Raptor, I was blown away by what I saw, and was shocked that no one thought of giving more attention to the bigger elephant in the room, the Zenmuse X9 sensor. We all know Sony was the queen of low-light performance for the past couple of years, but I was really surprised by the way the Ronin 4D not only outperformed the FX3 in low-light, but it also played in the same field as the big players like the V-Raptor. In this episode, I'll show you the tests and comparisons that led me to these very objective conclusions, along with the two major flaws I found in the 4D. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect camera after all. And finally, I'll share some very unexpected discoveries about the native ISO and dynamic range that were very impressive and disappointing at the same time. Quick heads up, this episode is extremely technical. I tried to simplify my nerdy two months of testing, but it might still be intense for many filmmakers. So clear your minds, brace yourselves, it's gonna be a fun ride. Let's start with a quick rundown of the sensor highlights. This is DJI's own Zenmuse X9. They have a 6K and an 8K version they just released. I'll only be talking about the 6K here, which I feel is a sweet spot between 4K and 8K. It's a full frame sensor with dual native ISO of 800 and 5000, with 14 plus stops of dynamic range, 9 stops of built-in ND, it can shoot 24 frames for cinema productions, and records ProRes RAW internally, along with a bunch of other ProRes compressions and H.264. You probably noticed already how these features feel like a step up from the typical mirrorless camera you find everywhere. They're more of a cinema camera kind of specs. Looking at the full frame sensor, I was surprised that it doesn't have any open gate or 16x9 modes. All we have was the DCI 17x9 image area, also a cinema standard. So it seems they're positioning it more as a dedicated cinema camera, or at least a mirrorless with cinema quality and features. So this 17x9 image area gives us a 6K clip maxing out at 48 frames. For higher speeds, it crops to a 239 to 1 ratio for up to 60 frames. You can still go even higher if you crop to Super 35 and drop to 4K for up to 96 frames. And for the final speed boost, you guessed it, you'll crop to 239 to 1 for up to 120 frames. So I went for a casual test drive with the camera to get some first impressions before I dissect it. I mainly shot in RAW to get the most honest image the camera can capture before any internal corrections or denoising are applied. I shot scenes with high dynamic range and different lighting conditions to try to find the breaking point of the camera. Here's a strongly backlit shot. I just applied the official 709 conversion LUT, and I remember on the monitor the sky looked like it was blown out. But in post, the waveform showed the highlight retained all the details. The sky didn't have much color that day anyway. The log image shows you the latitude it has in those highlights you can play with. So these were early promising signs on how the D-Log curve is clinging pretty well onto the highlights which I'll confirm with you in another control test I did. But what about the shadows? So in this clip, you can see a lot of good details in the shadow area. This might seem crushed, but it actually has so much details you can recover if you lift it up a bit. And here's the lock to see everything the camera captured. Also notice how the shadows look pretty clean. This was the native ISO of 800, but still the visible noise looked more like film grain to me. So I needed to push the camera a lot more than that. So I went for an eye test to see if these clean shadows will translate well in high ISOs. I was pretty much punishing the camera in New York's typical bad quality street lights, a DP's nightmare in other words. To me, the image looked pretty good. No major color issues, even when I underexposed the skin, I was able to bring it back to life with a minor mid-tone lift. Then up close, you can see a very reasonable amount of noise. Keep in mind this is raw, the noisiest format in the camera, since there's no internal denoising applied here. Here's how it will look if I add a denoising pass. So overall, I felt the camera performed super well in low light, but that didn't break the camera still. I needed to go for a more controlled stress test and do some comparisons with other cameras I'm more familiar with. Which leads us to a very interesting discovery in our next topic, ISO and low light performance. We know the camera has two ISO ranges. First one starts from 200 all the way up to 4000, where 800 is the first native ISO. Then the second native ISO starts at 5000, then reaching all the way up to 12800. We all know the logic says, the higher you go away from the native, the noisier the image gets. Then it would reset the noise again at the second native ISO, to reach the highest noise levels at the maximum of 12800. With that logic, if 4000 is the furthest setting from the cleanest 800 native, right before switching to the second native of 5000, then it should be the noisiest in that range. 
But that doesn't seem to be the case. Here we have two clips shot at ISO 4000 and 5000. But zooming into the shadows, the 4000 actually looks a bit cleaner than 5000. For a final quantifiable confirmation, I measured the noise levels on my Denoiser app, picked the same spot on both, and got my confirmation. The 4000 gave me 6.6 .6 noise levels and the 5000 gave me 7.8. So I took those results to my studio to replicate it in a more controlled environment. I measured the noise level in H.264, ProRes Quad 4, and ProRes RAW across all ISO settings and put them in this graph. I'll show you the actual clips in a second, but the graph again confirmed what I just saw. ISO 4000 has lower noise than ISO 5000, with a very dramatic dip in the noise in ProRes 444 and a more subtle one in H.264, which might mean that native ISO is 4000, not 5000. But if we isolate the raw results, there's a subtle dip at 4000, but probably not enough to qualify as a second native ISO. The whole graph looks almost linear, meaning noise just gets worse the higher you go on the ISO scale. At no point it resets in the conventional sense we know, which could mean the camera doesn't really have a second native ISO. The other good news, the difference between the lowest and highest noise levels is pretty small. And this is true in all the codecs I measured. This reminds me of the Red V Raptor. I was never scared of pushing it beyond 10,000 ISO. If we compare both RED and the 4D RAW formats, keep in mind RED has a huge advantage being 8K, meaning noise is a lot smaller in size, making it look a lot cleaner. With that in mind, RED has a lower noise level of 14 at ISO 800, but both have the same maximum noise level of 65. I need you to remember this number for a second because I thought if I bring the Sony FX3 to this comparison, being the most famous low-light monster, I was expecting it to be a tough contender and maybe even destroy them both. But what I saw was quite the opposite. Sony's noise performance is by far worse than both cameras. It reached all the way up to 187 at 10,000 ISO. Then it resets at the second native ISO of 12800 at 66 noise score. But remember, both 4D and the Raptor max out at 65 at 12800 ISO. Here's the graph of the three cameras together. You can see how the FX3 is way off the charts that at 10,000 ISO, it has three times the amount of noise of the 4D. It even had a marginal defeat in the battle of native ISO of 800. The most interesting is how both RED and the Ronin 4D max out their noise levels at 12,800, which matches Sony's ISO 3200 score. Okay, let's see how that looks like. Shooting side by side, first at ISO 3200, you can already see a bit of noise in the Sony. As we pixel peep, you can clearly see the massive difference between both. This test couldn't be more fair for both, because this is six ISO clicks from both their first native ISO of 800. Denoising can clear all this out, of course, and they'll look equally good. Now let's max out the 4D at 12800 and keep the FX3 at 3200. Based on my control tests, they should have similar noise levels. And as expected, they do look similar. That's pretty impressive, honestly, about the 4D. Once again, if we apply denoising on both, they look equally good. Let's go back to my control test super quick. This is the scene I shot to test noise, color, and highlight roll-off. So at 800, both are on their native ISO. The FX3 looks a bit softer, simply because it's 4K compared to 6K in the 4D. Jumping to 4000, the last stop before 4D flips into the second native ISO, and FX3 is halfway through its second ISO. Honestly, the 4D looks pretty good. The FX3 is starting to struggle already. At 8000, 4D is holding on pretty good, FX3 is falling apart, 10,000, FX3 is pretty much destroyed. 12800, finally FX3 resets at its second native, but noise levels look pretty close between them. For reference, here's the red at 12800. The noise levels look pretty similar, only red's noise look more monochromatic, which looks better for sure. Also here's the 4D's best and worst noise settings, at native 800 and at the maximum ISO of 12800. That's what I meant when I said the difference is not that bad between the first native and its maximum ISO setting. So let's check those high ISOs in another real-life comparison to check once again how things look on skin tones. I shot in ProRes RAW with both cameras side by side, matching their white balance at 4000 Kelvin. To visualize my test on the ISO scale, these are the native ISOs for the 4D, even though I believe it doesn't have a second native, but let's play along. The FX3 has a confirmed native of 800 and 12800 first comparison was at ISO 5000, giving the advantage to the 4D, then I repeated this at ISO 10000, where it's not native for either of them, but one step before the 4D maxes out, and also one step before the FX3 flips to the second native. Then finally at 12800, the second native for the FX3, and the absolute maximum for the 4D, giving the advantage to the FX3 this time. Starting with 5000 ISO, 
You can clearly see how Sony has a warm yellowish tint, something I've seen a lot in Sony's color science in general, while the 4D looks more neutral. So I'll just set Sony to 3500 for a more neutral look. Remember, this is raw, so what I'm doing is not affecting the noise in any way. Also, Sony looks a bit lifted in the shadows and has a nicer highlight roll-off on her face. So I'll just get them closer to each other with a simple curve for both. As for noise, from a distance, the 4D looks clean and I can already see some noise in the FX3. Zooming in, it's pretty clear Sony is not doing well. Then at 10,000, it's much clearer now how Sony has a sandy colored noise texture which doesn't look good. I tried to denoise it and it looks a lot better, but I struggled to completely remove the noise honestly. You can still see it lurking in the background in front of her eyes here, while in the 4D it's pretty clean. Also a lot of details were already lost in the FX3. Look at the hair roots for example on both. You literally see the individual hairs in the 4D, but the FX3 pretty much lost all those details. To be fair, the 6K resolution in the 4D is surely helping, but to also be fair, the noise in the FX3 was too much to handle. I guess that debunks the myth about bigger pixels means better light sensitivity. Now at 12800, finally Sony is back to the comfort of its second native ISO, looking a lot cleaner. While the 4D, as we already established, still looks good and holding on. Even up close, they look pretty similar. When denoised, I guess it's clear that the 4D held onto details a lot better. So bottom line, we saw how Sony quickly reaches the red zone as early as 3200 ISO, while the 4D never really reached any red zones. Noise just gets worse as you go up. Then I discovered it has a subtle reset at 4000, it's unofficial second native, but noise always stayed within a very reasonable and manageable level all the way up to 12800. And it's funny how at its worst, it still looked virtually identical to Sony's second native ISO of 12800. Of course Sony has the awesome advantage of going beyond 12800 and all the way up to over 100,000 ISO, and in the extended mode, all the way up to 400,000. Now I'm actually curious to see how the 4D would perform in those crazy ISOs. DJI should explore that in future updates. So shooting with a 4D, you can feel pretty confident maxing out your ISO. While shooting with Sony, I'd start getting worried between 4000 and 10,000, which is a pretty common range we use in night scenes. So yeah, when it comes to low light performance, I think it's fair to objectively say Ronin 4D destroyed the FX3. And I can safely say it's my current queen of low light, right after V-Raptor of course. Moving on to rolling shutter, that's where the DJI lost against the FX3. Here I shot the same vertical line with both cameras and superimposed them in this shot. FX3 is in blue, shooting full frame at 4K, and the 4D is in yellow, shooting full frame as well, but in 6K. As I whip pan, you can see how the DJI has a much more skewed angle than the FX3. Doing the math, the FX3 is 2.3 times faster than the 4D. Pretty impressive, honestly. This is on par with cinema cameras. I also confirmed the score from CineD's more scientific test that led to the same results. So I thought maybe the 6K is what's slowing down the 4D. So I dropped the resolution to 4K and even used the Super 35 mode to avoid any internal resizing that might affect its performance. I left everything the same in the FX3 apart from cropping it in post to match the framing. And funny enough, the 4D was even slower, making the FX3 more than 2.5 times faster than the Ronin 4D. Even if I consider a margin of error in my test, it won't be that much off. So this was pretty disappointing on the 4D front. I assume DJI designed this camera with the intention to be used with the gimbal, which would slow down your panning motions and hide the effects of the slow rolling shutter. But if we take the gimbal out of the equation, then we're left with a pretty slow sensor readout. I guess it's fair to say Sony destroyed DJI this time in the rolling shutter battle. Next comes dynamic range. We have two important informations you need to look for. First is the usable dynamic range the sensor can register. Second is the dynamic range versus ISO. And that's the most important one no one seems to really pay attention to. Let's start with the usable dynamic range. DJI claims the 4D can achieve over 14 stops on its website, but always take those marketing claim numbers with a grain of salt, simply because this number reflects all dynamic ranges, including the unusable ones buried deep under the noise floor. And that's usually one to three stops above the usable range that we care about. Some other brands probably include some of the partially clipped range in the highlights as well. I'll explain it and show you an example in a second. This is the CineD's Emetest chart for the 4D in its native ISO 800. And you can see how we have 12 usable stops, maybe 13 if we denoise it. The test readings for a usable image says 12.4, pretty good by today's standards anyway. Let's compare this to some of the popular cameras out there. Here I'm showing the camera's official claims in red versus the lab-tested usable dynamic range in blue. You can see how Sony and RED 
both famous for overhyping their camera's specs. They exaggerated their dynamic range claims by two and three stops above the usable score, so you always need to take their claims with a bigger grain of salt than others. Blackmagic and DJI's were more conservative in their claims with less than two stops above the usable. Then the most honest of them all is none other than Ari. Their claim is only half a stop off. I guess you don't really need to overhype your camera when you've set the highest quality bar for everyone else. Now I found another small discovery between the FX3 and the 4D. Even though they share the same usable dynamic range score, the 4D seems to perform better in my test. I shot the same scene and placed this white card with a light shining at its bottom to see how both cameras render light roll off and check the clipping point on each. Side by side, both look good, but probably you can't see the FX3 has some partial clipping here. You can see it better in the waveform. The blue channel seems okay, but if you look closely at the green and red channels, you can see some clipping happening. And that's what I meant earlier when I said partially clipped. Back to the Ronin 4D, all channels have a nice roll off curve in the highlights. I thought maybe the LUT caused this, so I went back to the log clips right out of the camera. But it's way more obvious now how the FX3 clearly clipped with a solid flat line in both red and green channels while the 4D has a super smooth slope across all channels. So this dynamic range probably picked up on the information from the blue channel and considered it as part of the FX3's 12.4 dynamic range score when it really shouldn't, just because of the missing information from both red and green channels. I could be wrong, I wish I had the proper testing equipment to conduct my own test and conclude this. Here's another interesting discovery. This is the red V-Raptor under the same conditions, lock footage without any LUTs. Of course, there's no clipping whatsoever, but check the waveforms side by side. Remember how the 4D's highlight roll-off curves looked super round and smooth? Basically, the more it looks like a quarter round or oval, the better and smoother the highlight roll-off will be. Have a look at the ones from red. You can see how they're a bit inconsistent, not as smooth, and look a bit bumpy in some points. I might be splitting hairs here, but these are some small things that might make a huge difference in some cases with specular highlights. Now we already established the 4D's usable dynamic range is not 14 plus stops, but 12.4 instead. But the camera cannot sustain this dynamic range across all ISO settings. That's why if you scroll further down on the website, you'll find the sensor's dynamic range performance chart across ISO settings. That's what I referred to earlier as dynamic range versus ISO. This graph will show you how you might be doing it all wrong. It will prove how increasing your ISO when it's dark might not be the best practice to get the best results out of this sensor. Let me show you what I mean. So the chart gives you two very useful informations. First is how much dynamic range you get from each corresponding ISO setting. So ISO 3200 and 12800 have the lowest dynamic range, so you should avoid them as much as you can. While 400 and 800 give you the maximum dynamic range possible, which we know now is actually 12.4. But the second crucial information you get is the distribution of that dynamic range across highlights and shadows. It's very important to know because sometimes it's counterintuitive and might not make any sense to what we're used to. Here's a funny example. ISO 200 is the worst for daytime or sunny outdoor because of having only 5 stops in the highlights. But it's best for shadow details because of its 9 stops below. So if you're shooting a daytime scene, you better not set it to 200, but instead use a strong ND and shift to one of these that have the highest highlight range. Same goes to 12800. It will only give you 6 stops in the shadows, three full stops lower than ISO 200, so it's by far the worst choice for dark scenes. I guess you get my point on why this shot will help you with some very counterintuitive decisions. Moving on to the internal ND quality. The Ronin 4D gave us an impressive nine consecutive stops of full spectrum ND filters. That's the maximum internal ND system range I've seen so far. So these nine stops are six more stops than the Blackmagic 6K Pro and even the brand new state-of-the-art Alexa 35 both having only two, four, and six stops of ND. And that's also three more stops than the Sony FX6 and the brand new Red V Raptor XL. But these have the advantage of using the more advanced electronic ND system, unlike the Ronin 4D's fully mechanical one. I measured half a second to cycle between each of these nine stops as they shift up and down or stack on top of each other. And that's when I had some concerns, since the more you stack filters and the higher you go with your ND stops density, the higher the risk of introducing undesired color shifts and all we care about in any neutral density filter is to be as color neutral as possible. I learned this lesson when I discovered in my episode about the Pocket 6K Pro how it shifted colors to blue in all its ND stops, with an extra blue shift in ND6. So to test the Ronin's ND color accuracy and consistency, I used the highest quality light I have, the Zolar 30C. It has an impressive SSI score of 90 at 3200 Kelvin, 
looking virtually indistinguishable from real tungsten light. So I shot a color chart first with a clear ND, took a snapshot of its vector scope, then did the same thing with all nine ND filters, and finally compared them all to the first one with a clear ND. Once again, the results were impressive, with a couple of subtle but expected shifts at higher stops. So from stops one to six, they're pretty clean. Then seven to nine had a subtle green shift, where the ninth stop has some extra green. To show you what I mean, here's how the clear reference looks like. I want you to focus on the vector scope center dot here, showing a neutral color when it's dead center in the graticule. Now when I shift to the seventh stop, did you notice this subtle shift towards the green vector? Let me toggle between them again. It's pretty subtle, but it's there. You can also see it in the chart, of course. Then if I bring the ninth stop, once again, let me toggle between them. You can see a stronger shift this time. So maybe avoid using those ND ranges if you're shooting a green screen. But again, these are very manageable shifts, all within an acceptable range. I'm personally happy and mostly impressed how they managed to squeeze nine stops of filtration with such a minimal amount of color shifts, considering how hard it is to restrict it in such high ND factors. I have many other tests and results that cover more aspects of the sensor, but that can take another hour. So to summarize, I believe the Zenmuse X9 is a high-end sensor even with its drawbacks. It has great potential to overtake the mirrorless market. I showed you how it was on par with Hollywood-level cinema cameras such as the V-Raptor. But the sensor's glory moment was overshadowed by the revolutionary gimbal camera hybrid everyone was talking about, which by all means is yet another awesome once-in-a-decade innovation by itself. But I feel this sensor still needs its 15 minutes of fame. So here's my two cents to DJI for their R&D of the new Ronin 4D Mark II. Create a modular system that splits the camera into three interchangeable parts. The sensor, the gimbal, and the brain. Where the gimbal part is detachable to let you attach the sensor directly to the body in a super sturdy way, which will solve the biggest issue with this camera. And that's finally being able to mount cinema lenses or any other oversized heavy lenses without the need for any sort of convoluted contraptions or cages. So until that happens, I invite you and all YouTubers to forget about the gimbal for a moment and pay more attention to the equally impressive thing about the Ronin 4D, the sensor.